condemning them morally and medically. The virile redolence of cigars, the pungent nip of pipe smoke, the tortoise shell richness they evoked constantly lured me out of the parlor onto the porch, though it was the parlor I preferred due to the presence of the Conklin sisters who played by turn uh, our untuned piano with a gifted, rollicking lack of airs. Indian Love Call was among their repertoire, and also a 1918 war ballad, The Lament of a Child Pleading with a House Thief, entitled, Don't Steal Daddy's Medals, He Won Them for Bravery. Annabelle played and sang. She was the oldest of the sisters and the loveliest, although it was a chore to pick among them, for they were like quadruplets of unequal height. One thought of apples, com compact and flavorful, sweet but cider tart. Their hair, loosely plaited, had the blue luster of a well-groomed ebony racehorse, and certain features, eyebrows, noses, lips when smiling, tilted in an original style that added humor to their charms. The nicest thing was that they were a bit plump, Pleasingly plump describes it precisely. It was while listening to Annabelle at the piano and falling in love with her that I felt Odd Henderson. I say felt because I was aware of him before I saw him. The sense of peril that warns, say, an experienced woodsman of an impending encounter with a rattler or bobcat alerted me. I turned, and there the fellow stood at the parlor entrance, half in, half out. To others, he must have seemed simply a grubby 12-year-old beanpole who had made some attempt to rise to the event by parting and slicking his difficult hair. The comb grooves were still damply intact. But to me, he was as unexpected and sinister as a genie released from a bottle. What a dumb head I'd been to think he wouldn't show up. Only a dunce wouldn't have guessed that he would come out of spite. The joy of spoiling for me this awaited day. However, Odd had not yet seen me. Annabelle, her firm acrobatic fingers somersaulting over the warped piano keys, had diverted him, for he was watching her, lips separated, eyes slitted, as though he had come upon her disrobed and cooling herself in the local river. It was as if he were contemplating some wished-for vision. His already red ears had become pimento. The entrancing scene so dazed him I was able to squeeze directly past him and run along the hall to the kitchen. He's here! My friend had completed her work hours earlier. Moreover, she had two colored women helping out. Nevertheless, she had been hiding in the kitchen since our party started, under the pretense of keeping the exiled Queenie company. In truth, she was afraid of mingling with any group, even one composed of relatives, which was why, despite her reliance on the Bible and its hero, she rarely went to church. Although she loved all children and was at ease with them, she was not acceptable as a child. Yet she could not accept herself as a peer of grown-ups, and in a collection of them behaved like an awkward young lady, silent and rather astonished. But the idea of parties exhilarated her. What a pity she couldn't take part invisibly, for then how festive she would have felt. I noticed that my friend's hands were trembling, so were mine. Her usual outfit consisted of calico dresses, tennis shoes, and Uncle B's discarded sweaters. She had no clothes appropriate to starchy occasions. Today she was lost inside something borrowed from one of her stout sisters, a creepy navy blue dress its owner had worn to every funeral in the county since time remembered. He's here, I informed her for the third time. Odd Henderson. Well, then why aren't you with him, she said admonishingly. That's not polite, buddy. He's your particular guest. You ought to be out there seeing he meets everybody and has a good time. 
I can't. I can't speak to him. Queenie was curled on her lap, having a head rub. My friend stood up, dumping Queenie and disclosing a stretch of navy blue material sprinkled with dog hair, and said, Buddy, you mean you haven't spoken to that boy? My rudeness obliterated her timidity. Taking me by the hand, she steered me into the parlor. She need not have fretted over Odd's welfare. The charms of Annabel Conklin had drawn him to the piano. Instead, he was scrunched up beside her. Indeed, sorry. Indeed, he was scrunched up beside her on the piano seat, sitting there studying her delightful profile, his eyes opaque as the orbs of the stuffed whale I'd seen that summer when a touring honky-tonk passed through town. It was advertised as the original Moby Dick, and it cost five cents to view the remains. What a bunch of crooks. As for Annabelle, she would flirt with anything that walked or crawled. No, that's unfair, for it was really a form of generosity, of simply being alive. Still, it gave me a hurt to see her playing cute with that mule skinner. Hauling me onward, my friend introduced herself to him. Buddy and I were so happy you could come. Odd had the manners of a billy goat. He didn't stand up or offer his hand. Hardly looked at her and at me, not at all. Daunted but dead game, my friend said, Maybe Odd will give us a tune. I know he can. His mother told me so. Annabelle Sugar, play something Odd can sing. Reading back, I see that I haven't thoroughly described Odd Henderson's ears. A major omission, for they were a pair of eye catchers, like alfalfas in the Our Gang comedy pictures. Now, because of Annabelle's flattering receptivity to my friend's request, his eyes became so beat bright it made your eyes smart. He mumbled. He shook his head hang dog, but Annabelle said, Do you know I have seen the light? He didn't, but her next suggestion was greeted with a grin of recognition. The biggest fool could tell his modesty was all put on. Giggling, Annabelle struck a rich chord and odd, in a voice precociously manly, sang, When the red, red robin comes bob, bob, bobbing along. The Adam's apple in his tense throat jumped. Annabelle's enthusiasm accelerated. The women's shrill hen chatter slackened as they became aware of the entertainment. Odd was good. He could sing for sure, and the jealousy charging through me had enough power to electrocute a murderer. Murder was what I had in mind. I could have killed him as easily as swat a mosquito easier. Once more, unnoticed even by my friend who was absorbed in the musicale, I escaped to the parlor and sought the island. That was the name I had given a place in the house where I went when I felt blue or inexplicably exuberant or just when I wanted to think things over. It was a mammoth closet attached to our only bathroom. The bathroom itself, except for its sanitary fixtures, was like a cozy winter parlor with a horsehair love seat, scatter rugs, a bureau, a fireplace and framed reproductions of the doctor's visit, September morn, the swan pool, and calendars galore. There were two small stained glass windows in the closet. Lozenge-like patterns of rose, amber, and green light filtered through the windows, which looked out on the bathroom proper. Here and there, patches of color had faded from the glass or been chipped away. By applying an eye to one of these clearings, it was possible to identify the room's visitors. After I'd been secluded there a while, okay, so everybody get it? He's hiding in a closet spying on the bathroom, right? Okay. After I'd been there a while brooding over my enemy's success, footsteps intruded. 
This is Mary Taylor Wheelwright, who stopped before a mirror, smacked her face with a powder puff, rouged her antique cheeks, and then, perusing the effort, announced, Very nice, Mary, even if Mary says so herself. It is well known that women outlive men. Could it merely be superior vanity that keeps them going? Anyway, Mrs. Wheelwright sweetened my mood, and so, when following her departure, a heartily rung dinner bell sounded through the house. I decided to quit my refuge and enjoy the feast regardless of Odd Henderson.